Uh, what usually happens is that some accidental process leads to a particular group of people, say the people who had horses, mm. uh, finding themselves on top. But then the crucial thing is, is how do you, uh, how do you maintain your position? Mm. How do you establish not just a temporary hierarchy, but a long-lasting hierarchy? And then after 300 years, coming to the peasants and saying, look, 300 years ago, my great, great, great grandfather had a horse, so now <laughs> you must all obey me. It, it wouldn't convince anybody. And <laughs> I'd love to see people try, though. That would be well worth it. And similarly, if you take like a modern example, if in the 19th century, I don't know, in, in, in the southern United States, the white plantation owner would come to the, to the slaves on the plantation and say, OK, 300 years ago, this and this happened. This is why you are now slaves on, on my plantation. Not only it would be very difficult for these people to accept it, even for himself, to explain it to himself what justifies my position, my privileges, my power. People need some kind of much deeper justification than some accident of history that happened 300 years ago. So they invent all kinds of stories. Uh, for instance, of racial superiority of religious justifi justification. Like in, in India, you have this basic creation myth that you had the original beings, the Purusha and the Brahmins, the upper castes, they came out of its head. Mm -hmm. And the, the Shudras, well, at the bottom of the hip, they came out of his legs. So this is why they must obey the, the Brahmins. Now, this sounds much more acceptable if you, if you put it in, in the right religious context, then saying that 2,000 years ago, some tribes from Central Asia invaded the Ganges Valley and subjugated the local population, and this is why we have now this caste system. Move on to another disparity, which I know uh, we, I, I, was, I was primed to definitively ask you about this okay. this evening, and that's gender. Mm. Um, in your book, you, 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 you show that so many cultures geographically spread around the world, temporally spread across history, have prioritized men over women. Mm -hmm. and, and you struggle to, to, to offer, as everyone does, a convincing explanation for why that is and why such communities have been so stable. Mm -hmm. uh, can, um, can you talk us through that? Have you got any more insights uh, since writing the book as to how we might explain um, and understand that and, and quite why it's been such an incredible phenomenon? Well, it's one of the biggest riddles of history because it's obvious that in this case, it's not just the result of some one accidental event, and it's not just the, the result of one uh, accidental story, because you see the same structure in different ways uh, in almost all societies. There are exceptions, but in most societies known to science for thousands of years. Now, the simplest explanation that comes to the mind of many people is that men are physically stronger than women, so it's obvious why they have dominated society. But this doesn't really fit in with a lot of other things we know about human beings and about apes uh, uh, in general, and that is that uh, uh, social power, in most cases, is the result of social skills, not of physical strength. If you look at the hierarchies of many most human organizations, they, not they do not correlate with physical strength. If you think about maybe the most long-lasting uh, organization in the world today, the Christian church, uh, you don't become pope by beating up all the other cardinals. <laughs> and I, I think that I won't be offending anybody if I say that, that Pope Francis is not the strongest Catholic on earth in, in physical terms. So I've got this image of sort of a weightlifting competition <laughs> happening in the Sistine Chapel now or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and it's not just the Catholic Church. I mean, you look everywhere. I mean, you look even at cr criminal organizations. So very often the big boss is somebody in his 50s or 60s whose power is the ability to tell other people, some thugs in their 20s, to go and kill someone. He's not going and killing him himself. And even among chimpanzees, uh, the alpha male is not the strongest male physically. He is the male that is able to construct stable coalitions of supporters, so it's social skills. And it's very often at least believed that women have better social skills than, than men. And if so, and if social skills are the key to uh, uh, social superiority, so how come men dominate society? 
There is another very common theory that, okay, maybe it's not physical strength, but it's the uh, issue of childbirth and, and taking ch care of children, that women are all the time occupied with being pregnant, with taking care of children, so they don't have time uh, to do all the important stuff, which they, they, they leave uh, to men. But the problem with this theory is that among other animals, like elephants, like bonobos, uh, the pygmy chimpanzees, we have cases of precisely because the females are the ones that are responsible for taking care of the young, they need more support. And because they need more support, they need to cooperate more. And they develop, this is why they develop their social skills, because they need help from other elephants or from other uh, chimpanzees in raising the, the young. And what you get is a network of females which dominates society, whereas the males, which have much uh, fewer responsibilities with regard to raising the children, they are much more autonomous, they are much more self-centered, they have uh, more difficulties in cooperating, and they are basically pushed aside. So even though the individual uh, male bonobo is stronger than the in individual female bonobo, you have a network of cooperating females that dominate society. If this is possible among bonobos or elephants, why not among uh, human beings? Which, uh, in, which ca in, in, in their case, I mean, social skills are, are the most important skills. One of the possibilities, uh, it still doesn't have the, the backing of enough empirical data, so uh, uh, it's not like the answer. But one of the possibilities is that maybe this common idea that uh, women have uh, superior social skills is not true at least when it comes to large-scale cooperation. One possibility which is worth exploring, and I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing it's just a possibility, it's not, it still hasn't got enough uh, scientific backing, is that, yes, in, in small-scale societies, women have superior social skills, but when it comes to the big organizations as, that are based on all this myth-making, and in which case you have to cooperate with complete strangers, then the, the, you have the reverse situation that women precisely because they need the, um, uh, the direct social connection, they are at a disadvantage, whereas men who are much more comfortable with an alienated situation, with an impersonal hierarchy which is based on make-believe, and not on actually knowing the other person, they feel much more comfortable with this kind of situation. So when you have large-scale societies and huge impersonal hierarchies, this is the situation where men actually have superior social skills. Now, as I said, it is just a theory worth examining. It's not the answer. I remember vividly uh, from undergrad studies reading Herodotus, and he tells a story about a, a tribe where all the women of the village, uh, for every male sexual partner, they put a bracelet uh, mm. on their leg. And then when all the women of a particular generation get to a certain age, uh, they count up their bracelets, and the woman with the most bracelets becomes chieftain of the village. <laughs> um, <and laughs> Herodotus looks on it with some, some amusement, I have to say, but it kind of, it's an interesting kind of... There are examples that, that break your... The, the paradigm, mm. as it were, but they are very few and far between, mm. isn't it? And, and, and usually they are from small-scale societies. Mm. We don't know of any, like, big empire which was matriarchal. Mm. It's a, one of the questions of history still to be understood. Yeah. Like, kind of. um, can we break, come on to, to one of your, your, your main myths that you talk about in the book, money? And we've mm -hmm. mentioned it once or twice already this evening. And, and one of the things you say about money is that, that you know, it can bridge any cultural gap, even though Osama bin Laden is taking American dollars. And I just wondered how you felt that uh, uh, foil, um, if we place it against the recent economic crises that have been rocking Europe, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly kind of posited through Greece, etc., which seemed to me to have been having a very uh, divisive effect and, and opening up cultural gaps, if anything. <laughs> how would you say the two work together? Well, I think in the recent economic crisis all over the world, we got some amazing examples of the power of our belief in money. At the height of the economic crisis, uh, I think two or three years ago, the Federal Reserve in the US was creating every day $3 billion out of nothing. They created altogether a trillion dollars 
during, uh, uh, during that year, simply by going into the computer and adding a few zeros somewhere. That's it. I mean, you, today you don't even print the money. Most money is not even printed. It's just electronic data. The basic uh, material from which you make money is human trust. If you have trust, you can monetize it into anything, into even, even into electronic data. So despite the, 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 the recent uh, hits that uh, the capitalist system uh, has had in, 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 since 2008, still the amount of trust that most people in the world have in the capitalist system is incredible. And uh, this is what enables, for example, the, the banks to create so much money out of nothing. You have trust in money and in the system that produces money. You have also trust in the basic uh, capitalist stories that say, first of all, maybe the most basic story of all of capitalism is the answer to all problem, the key to all the questions that bother us is economic growth. No matter what you want, in the long term, the only way to achieve it is economic growth. You want equality, you want freedom, you want employment, you want democracy, you want peace, name it, it's through economic growth. And if there will not be economic growth, in the long run, you won't have any of that. On the personal level, this translates into another extremely powerful myth, the myth of consumerism, which is part of this package, that if you have any problem on the personal level, the solution is to buy something. <laughs> any problem whatsoever, you probably need to buy something and then it will be okay. It can be, you can buy a product or you can buy a service, you can buy a car, you can buy yoga, you can buy marriage counseling, whatever. But the answer to all the problems of humankind on the collective level, they come from economic growth. On the individual level, they come from buying more stuff. And still the vast majority of the population, certainly in Europe, and most of the world, they believe in these stories. And if ever they stop believing in those stories, then the capitalist system will collapse. Take you on to an another of your, your big myths, thinking about religion. Now, you, you take us through in the book a lot of the religions of the world today and show how there's a certain amount of <laughs> cognitive dissonance in quite a few of them. But I was wanted to direct your attention towards what you think about the religions of the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, obviously, particularly as you pointed out right at the beginning, we're in the throes of a new revolution, the industrial revolution, the, the scientific revolution that is really going to change mm -hmm. our world once again, beyond anything that we understand now. And how do you see religion in the future? I mean, are there going to be techno-based religions? I mean, I think this morning on, on Radio 4 you were talking about Silicon Valley yeah. uh, as, 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 as some god to be worshipped, uh, perhaps now and, and certainly in the future. Yeah, I think the future belongs to techno-religions. I mean, the big religions, the important religions of the 21st century are more likely to emerge from Silicon Valley than they are from the Middle East or from Afghanistan or Syria or any of these places. Um, it's a bit similar to what happened in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, when the Industrial Revolution swept through the world, you had a lot of reaction. It created a lot of, uh, of new problems. It destroyed a lot of old certainties and hierarchies. As uh, Marx and Engels wrote in the uh, Communist Manifesto, everything solid melts into air. And when everything solid melts into air, people become very afraid and they look back to some reassuring old tradition, mythology, religion to give them security. So back in the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution led to a wave of fundamentalism all over the world. Uh, the biggest war of the 19th century was not the Napoleonic Wars, it was not the American Civil War, it was the Taiping Rebellion in China, when in reaction, to the coming of the Industrial Revolution, of British imperialism, of the collapse of the old Chinese system, you had this failed scholar, Hong Xiu Kuang, who had a vision from God, allegedly, in which God revealed to Hong that he, Hong, is the younger brother of Jesus Christ, sent to earth to establish the kingdom of heavenly peace. And he went around southern China with this message of heavenly peace. 
And millions followed him into the Taiping Rebellion, which was the most bloody war of the 19th century. According to the most uh, uh, moderate estimates, 20 million people died, perished, in the Taiping Rebellion, which lasted 14 years until it was uh, repressed. The biggest war. And similarly, you had other fundamentalist movements, like you had in Sudan, the Mahdi, quite similar in, in some respects to what we see today in the Middle East. But none of this worked. When we look back to the 19th century, we don't remember it as the age of faith. The really important religion or ideology that came out of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century was socialism. In 1800, you didn't have any socialists. It started very little, but then it spread like wildfire and became the most important ideological movement of the era, changing our lives completely. And the key to the success of the socialists was that they were relevant. They looked to the future, not to the past. They didn't study ancient scriptures. They studied the technology and the economic structures created by the Industrial Revolution. Therefore, they had something relevant to say about the new problems and opportunities of the Industrial Revolution. Now we are in the midst of a second Industrial Revolution. This time, the main engines of change are not steam and electricity, they are uh, uh, biotechnology and computer science, intelligent design. This time, the main products will not be textiles and vehicles and things like that. They will be bodies and brains and minds. The main products of the 21st century are likely to be bodies and brains and minds. And the Islamic State has nothing relevant to say about the new opportunities and danger of this. For example, what will happen when artificial intelligence will replace most humans in the job market? Uh, experts estimate that it could pay, take as little as 30 or 40 years for this to happen. You don't have any answer in the Bible what to do when humans are no longer useful to the economy. You need completely new ideologies, completely new religions, and they are likely to emerge from Silicon Valley or from Bangalore and not from uh, uh, the Middle East. And they are likely to, pro to give people visions based on technology. Everything that the old religions promised, uh, happiness and justice and even eternal life, but here on earth with the help of technology and not after death with the help of some supernatural being.